Annie Cattrall was born in Glasgow and studied fine art at Glasgow School of Art, the University of Ulster and the Royal College of Art, where she also has been a tutor since 2000 and has lectured in many art colleges including Edinburgh, uh, University of the Arts London, Ulster, South Australia, Alfred University USA and Goldsmiths. She was elected uh, an RSA in 2012 and is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Sculptors. Annie's father was a medical phys phys physicist and mother a painter, an art teacher, so perhaps it was inevitable that Annie is an interdisciplinary artist and her practice is often informed by working with specialist, specialists in science and from particular geological locations. This includes neuroscience, meteorology, engineering, psychiatry and the history of science. This approach has enabled her to learn about cutting-edge research and in-depth information in these fields. She is particularly interested in the parallels and connections that can be drawn between art, science and the poetic. Annie has undertaken uh, many large-scale public art commissions, including Echo at the Forest of Dean Sculpture Trail, O to 10 Million, the award-winning biochemistry uh, department of uh, 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 Oxford University. Recently, she was lead artist at the new museum site at Cambridge University, where she completed a public commission, Remains to be Seen, situated at the old Cavendish Laboratories and Student Services Building. Therefore, we are delighted and privileged to welcome from London, where she lives and works, Annie Cattrall. Thank you. Welcome to what is essentially my, my home, actually. Um, when Robbie invited me to do this, um, I, I did sort of mention that I had two spaces where I work. And uh, one is in Deptford, which is a kind of large... Um, dirty kind of space where I can use equipment that I couldn't use at home and um, this space I'm in tonight is what I would describe as a kind of thinking room and a place where I do small-scale work and I do a lot of drawing. Um, I'm going to take you downstairs as well because I went to my studio in Deptford this morning and I brought a few items with me uh, which I thought would give a bit more kind of texture to the kind of three-dimensional aspects of my work and perhaps show some of the kind of thinking through materials because um, that's eventually what happens when I'm sort of generating work. So um, I was, as, as Robbie says, I was born in Glasgow. I went to Glasgow School of Art um, and um, in, in 1992, um, after about 10 years or eight years of after I finished art school, I um, got a job in the art school in Cheltenham in the sculpture department. And rather than going to Cheltenham, I decided that I would try out London because I'd always fancied living there and commute up to do my 0.5 senior lecturing job in Cheltenham. And um, so I've been in London ever since. I sort of came speculatively thinking that I would last maybe six months a year and it's been getting on for 28 years now. Um, so I've made it my home but I call myself a Scottish Londoner. I feel my identity is rooted almost entirely in Scotland but I do like London um, in the sense that I like its, its, its kind of breadth, its size, its um, all the different things that happen and the kind of people that you can meet and the art you can see and it's a very vibrant place even even during lockdown it was so um yeah so this is my my space i wanted to i'm doing this with my computer so i'll try to um i don't have uh, it rigged up for me to kind of show you uh things with a little kind of iphone or anything like that but there is a part of it which i will use the iphone for um, but I'll just going to lift this up and kind of take you around the space a bit um, because I think you can see here, this is my kind of board that I uh, put things up onto. These are all my drawings. I draw kind of incessantly really and um, I see drawing as part of the process of, of making sculpture. So it's often quite sort of materially led and not necessarily representation, I'm not representing necessarily anything um, that um, is, as it were, kind of 
a replica of, of, of life in any sense of a form. So they're kind of notations. Um, and these are works here that relate to um, work I've been doing about the landscape and taking an index from the landscape and taking a profile from that and then drawing it as a kind of panorama, um, which will then eventually lead to making a sculpture. Another piece up top was, whoops, sorry, I'm trying to keep it level. Um, sorry, uh, is, is one of, um, look, imagining um, if, if a forest was flooded and, uh, and actually seeing it, not necessarily as being blue like water, but actually thinking of it as a kind of a lake of something which is a kind of not natural. Um, so these are um, some, also some works that I've made, which again, I think of as, as being um, sort of like drawings and sculpture. So they're cut into paper. And I've actually shown these some time ago in um, the RSA. Um, there's another one. So they're kind of scribbles, which are then kind of cut out and uh, very kind of precarious and fine. And a lot of my work is has that kind of quality to it. It's got a kind of fragility and a, a precariousness about it. This is actually la laser cut, but it's a very kind of fine um, paper cut piece of work called Sustain. So yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my influences. And as, as Robbie said, my mum and dad were both very influential to me. Dad was a physicist and he would bring home things like uh, an x-ray uh, at the end of a day because he was also um, the radiation protection officer in the infirmary in Edinburgh. And I was always fascinated by that and just thinking about how you could see inside a, a, a human body when it was um, still still alive rather than as a, as a kind of autopsy. Not that I was really aware of that as a child, but seeing that option of thinking that you can see something that you wouldn't normally be able to see or be able to kind of understand and so I've you know spent a lot of time um, looking at kind of um, you know I don't know if you could yeah sort of very you know anatomical drawings and going to kind of autopsies myself and watching neurosurgery and all sorts of um, other procedures um, through residencies that I've done in Oxford University um, and working with neuroscientist Morten Kringlebach. So um, I do love part of you know, the way that um, art can allow me into places where I probably wouldn't be able to go under any other circumstances. And it's that kind of total immersion that I really find stimulating, whether it's kind of climbing a mountain or whether it's actually kind of um, you know, watching neurosurgery with the permission of, of, of the patients, um, then it, there's something very kind of um, three-dimensional about the experience, as it were. You can kind of see, touch, and, and kind of sense the whole um, thing. And it's not something you can kind of switch off. And I think that really does inform the work that I make. I'm not exactly sure how but I think it sort of heightens my awareness to such an extent that it kind of propels me into often to another way of thinking. So when I'm doing something like walking or um, up a hill or neurosurgery, I often have my, my phone with me and I'll be taking photographs and kind of observing whether it's sort of in slow motion or whether it's um, just still photographs and then bring them back to the studio and then start to kind of decipher what I want to do from that. Um, and one of the other things that I also do when I'm in the landscape is I tend to kind of cast things. Um, here we go. I've got some more downstairs, but I take casts in the landscape. This is a small one where I just put silicon directly onto, say, a rock or onto some sort of a tree or something like that. And then I get it back to the studio and make molds from it. I think Kenny and Ann and Bevan have both talked quite a lot about mold making and stuff, but I'll show you downstairs a bit more of the 
um, of that process myself. But this is a kind of line from Australia when I was over doing a residency in Canberra in 2016, I think it was. And um, I really like the idea of, of, of making a line um, almost like a kind of drawing or an index of a particular orientation on a rock, um, in, which was actually in the Botanic Gardens in um, Canberra. And the rocks actually, oddly enough, had been brought from uh, Uluru, or around, not actually Uluru, but in that central area, and they'd been brought to kind of emulate the centre of Australia in Canberra. So it was kind of a double interesting um, thing that they would, not only was the rock relocated, but then I was taking it and bringing it back to London. And I'll show you later what I've done with it downstairs. But anyway, suffice to say that it's this index of Australia. Um, and, and part of that process of always is of, of um, I feel as though it's better just to kind of show you so these things is that's an index of direct cast from um, a, a rock, a sort of rock face come, uh, yeah, no, it was actually a bit of wood in um, Australia too. And I took that and it was showing the kind of growth formation and that sense of time, which is prevalent in growth. And those linear qualities here sort of show how it actually was, how it grew. And I like to take those kind of that information and then use it in my work. One of the things that I find really important um, in terms of work is trying to kind of synthesize, and maybe that's a personal thing after having been brought up by an artist and a scientist, is trying to sort of make sense of where they meet and where they bridge together. And if they don't, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And I certainly don't feel like I illustrate science, but I, I think I like the kind of ras the rational, um, methodological approaches that science can allow and then within that sort of gamut of kind of um, experience it mean it allows me to sit, to sort of edit right back to make some hopefully kind of poetic moment that comes directly from that kind of endeavor so um, some of the drawings that I did from that profiling end up like this so they're kind of linear and um, are almost sort of describing what isn't seen rather than what's, if you see what I mean, it's the, um, this part is actually air as it were, rather than, rather than the rock itself. So it's almost as if the kind of space around the rock actually becomes more important than the rock itself. Um, so describing what's unseen and, and often just felt rather than actually what's actually there. I'm absolutely fascinated by materials and I often get into long discussions with people about ways of making things and how things might be resolved. And one of the kind of, so I'm always picking up things. And when I knew I was gonna do this talk, I started to kind of bring things out of my cupboards. And this is one of them, which looks rather, um, sort of unnatural, I suppose, but it generated a, a piece of work that I made and I'll show some slides of it later on um, uh, of, the, uh, of this talk. And basically what it is, it's a whole lot of sequins that move and re react to the, to the wind. I was hoping it might be windy tonight, but it's not. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of blow it. And I think you can see that it moves and it kind of picks up what, again, what isn't, what's felt but isn't seen. So it's kind of reacts to um, the elements. Uh, other things that I look at, I use a, a lot of glass. Um, this is something I picked up, um, which is kind of a bit like um, a sort of egg timer, but it's very, as you can see, it's very, very thin. And I got it in a market. And I just love that kind of quality of matter changing and moving and something which kind of, starts to talk about transformative moments um, and also suggests a kind of a possibility of this kind of space on the inside. I don't know how well you can see that. It's probably better from, from my uh, angle, but anyway, you can just sort of see that it's falling down in quite a kind of beautiful, almost um, 
as if it's in slow motion. And again, with my camera, when I'm gathering information to make work, the slow motion um, button option uh, has, has really helped. And I kind of see slow motion filming almost a bit like uh, looking down a microscope. Um, it doesn't enlarge it, but it makes you, allows you to see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see with the naked eye. Um, often things which are moving really fast, like water or say a bird moving and flapping its wings. Um, in the slow motion uh, option, you kind of really get to see all the kind of in, all the kind of tiny details. And I think that really helps me to kind of understand things um, and it, it informs my work. So one of the things I've done during lockdown, I have to say that when lockdown happened, I was up in um, Lewis. Uh, to have doing a, undertaking a residency through Anne Lanterre, which was an RSA one. And I'd gone all the way up there and I'd driven the whatever it is, felt like a thousand miles, I don't know what it was, but felt a long way, stopping off in Edinburgh with friends and really looking forward to it. I'd been planning it for a long time. And we had a show also planned for Anne Lanterre at the end of the residency. So it would show work from the residency, but also existing work. Um, and I just was really looking forward to that. But when I got up there and on the island, it became very clear that it would be really difficult to stay there. Um, I mean, with, the, with hindsight, it probably would have been fine, but actually it just felt like I needed to get home. And um, so I did. But I kind of had 10 days there of just immersing myself in the landscape and started to make work almost immediately as I came back. Um, and I started to, do uh, sorry, I'm just gonna started to make these drawings, which were basically putting ink into um, bubble fairy liquid, um, eco fairy liquid, whatever that is, and um, burst bubbles with um, ink in them. And so you can kind of see a little bit of what the kind of formation of it of, of those bubbles and then bursting and what that's like and um, so in a way my intervention in it was just to set it up it wasn't really to kind of um, the so random what happened in relationship to the end result but it felt like it began to kind of sum up aspects of the, watching the sea in Lewis and um, just kind of that idea of things sort of being frozen in time um, felt a very important part of it. So um, what I thought I'd do is just take you on a walk and um, just show you some of my other things here. I do work a lot from home. Um, so this is one of my drawings that I did, which is actually a kind of working drawing for a piece of uh, sculpture at Oxford Biochemistry Department. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later with, with slides, but I kind of just wanted to show you how I work things out. I'm quite um, manual, uh, analog. I like to kind of print things out, like these are birds that are colliding together. And um, each one had a number and a space. This is them orientated in space as we as we then suspended them in an atrium space at Oxford University. And so each one has a number and it's on a grid. And I, I kind of really like that. I like that sort of solving problems and kind of working it out manually. Um, so there's three of those. These are, these are other works that I've made as well during kind of lockdown. It's difficult to show them entirely, but they're kind of um, just drawings with made sort of line, lines and uh, are very kind of meditative to do. And as we go downstairs, um, I'll just take you into my living room, which often becomes a studio space. And uh, so I just wanted to show you some, some works that I've made, just to give you an idea of sort of, um, there we go. Sorry if it's a bit, there we go. So that's a piece I made some time ago. It's kind of, one I've shown a, a, a lot, it's um, a set of lungs which are made of um, Pyrex glass and um, they're essentially um, the organ of air is made by using air to kind of manipulate it 
And I quite like that idea of the sort of paradox in there. And in a way, although it's difficult to show this here um, without installing it on the wall, but um, I think you can see that the shadows are actually quite important and the fragility is kind of um, pretty immense in some ways. It's very difficult to move the work around. Um, other pieces that I've done, which are about anatomical information was I got, I did a residency once with, um, and this is basically a rapid prototype of a three dimensional um, model of my heart, heart and a part of my lungs and my neck. And I'm kind of quite interested in what happens with that data you get from scanning and uh, how that can be manipulated three dimensionally. Um, there's so many things that I've got here, which I just thought I'd bring out to give you an idea of what goes on. And this is the, one of the kind of casts of the rock um, in Australia as well, in a very brightly coloured pink. And then it, and that's it kind of cast in a positive, which is in white, uh, something called jesmonite, um, which is a kind of water-based resin and quite ecological, which is nice because all those things in the past have been quite um, intense in terms of smell and uh, toxicity, which is actually what this is. I don't know if you can see that. I'll go under the light. Um, this is a uh, part of the piece that Robbie mentioned, which was in the Forest of Dean. This is a sample of rock there, which is 310 million years old. And uh, the idea that at <clears throat> one point it was uh, down in the Mediterranean, this particular pennant sandstone, and it moved up in the Super Pangaea and uh, ended up in the Forest of Dean. So that I found kind of inspiring, actually, uh, to think that, you know, that the kind of time span of that um, moving around um, so slowly, way beyond my life, <laughs> life span, obviously, um, it just felt very important. And it kind of informed another piece that I've done quite recently in um, Inverness called Seer, which is in the city centre, um, which I'll talk about a bit about. Hello. So yeah, this is just to give you a texture. I won't get into too much detail. This is using motion capture of two dancers that I was working with when I was uh, doing some work with Siobhan Davis Dance. And they had uh, sensors on their body. And this is the piece of work that came out of that. Um, and this is other work, which is to do with looking inside the brain. And um, this is actually a photogram of the inside of a skull illuminated by sunlight. So I, I managed to get sunlight through a fiber optics into the dark, in my brother's dark room. And, we've, and we illuminated these. And so it kind of was a bit like um, bringing light from the outside. Um, sorry, it's a bit shaky, whoops. Um, yeah, so there we go. That, that's a kind of top of a skull and um, it's illuminated with, with sunshine in the dark room. So it's a bit like a cyanotype in a way. And these are other pieces that have come of that work as well, which is, um, um, inside of a sc human skull. I was working with people in Guy's Hospital and um, I was really interested in the way that um, our skulls are in a way our houses in a way and uh, so the idea that our thoughts and everything is housed there. So I wanted to make a piece of work about that. So I cast inside the top of a skull um, cast that area as well. These are all bronze and, um, and that's the kind of top of the, the skull. So there was sort of three parts to it and then they were silvered because I quite like that quality of silver rather than bronze for this work. And you can see the little kind of sutras running down the top of it which kind of are there I think when babies are born and more prevalent and then as they get older they knit together. Um, but it also felt a little bit like looking down uh, into a kind of river or a sort of aerial photograph as well. So that kind of idea of scale and things being um, very small and inside the body and then also being echoed um, 
in nature is one that I've kind of drawn quite a few times, made work, which has kind of drawn uh, those two things together. Uh, last piece here, which I wanted to show you, which again was shown, I think, in the RSA a while ago, which was um, my, sorry, it's trying to get the camera right. Um, my mum's, my mum's eye, um, sorry, my eye and uh, my, niece, my niece's eye. So it was about three generations of, of females in my family. And actually, as it happens, it's my niece whose eye it was. She was about 10 at the time, I think, and now she's 20 today. So she's uh, all grown up and sadly mum's no longer with us but um, that's that idea of kind of uh, seeing through and that kind of as if your eyes somehow are well I think they, I understand it they are considered to be part of your brain so um, so the scientists tell me so um, yeah anyway so what I thought I'd do oh, one of the things um, I was going to end up at, at the end of my uh, slideshow which I'll show briefly after this was to show you this project I've been doing with sunflowers. Um, I've been planting them since I got back down from Lewis because I felt like I needed to do something hopeful and uh, something and I'm fortunate in London to have a front and a back garden and so I've been doing that and then harvesting the seeds um, which are those are the kind of dried ones with some of them have still got their seeds in them, but some of them the seeds have been removed and then casting them in silicon. So it's been a kind of project that's come directly out of COVID just in order to kind of do something which felt positive about sort of um, generating new things beyond um, the, the, the actual kind of virus. And I think when I left, Lewis, I was talking to my neighbour who was running a croft and uh, he had just had a lamb born and, and we were both kind of commenting on the fact that spring just goes on no matter what, uh, even with all these different things and crises. So it was kind of a nod to that idea. Um, I've also been casting a lot of little things like this, which are um, poppy heads as well and collecting the seeds and also collecting all the flowers from the sunflowers which I think you can eat. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't tried it yet, I'm still kind of researching that, I don't want to make any kind of have any trouble there so I thought anybody, any advice welcome. And then been kind of also um, doing something I did as a child which is basically press the flowers and I don't know what I'm going to do with them but it just feels important to do something kind of positive and also something which is enjoyable during this this kind of time of flux and change. So I just thought I'd show you a few of the larger projects so you can sort of see how my thinking is. This is my office, sorry if it's a bit of a kind of through the keyhole situation. Um, I'm a great uh, hoarder and organizer of detailed things so I don't like throwing anything away and uh, so sometimes something I probably should do is clear out a bit more but uh, anyway I this is this is my den where I do my teaching because I teach a bit at the RCA and through this time I've been doing that teaching too which has been great to, and a privilege to work with the students and it's been quite disappointing for them not to be able to get into the studios so to actually kind of uh, be able to kind of communicate with them in wherever whichever room they're in and this is where I do my bit from. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and here we go. So um, yeah hang on I'll just uh, tools with it. Um, here we go. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of quickly show you, and anybody's very welcome to get back in touch with me if they want any more further detail. Um, this is my, the kind of what I would call my kind of dirty studio in a way. Um, this is in Deptford in, in East London. And I just took these pictures this morning and that one on the bottom right is, is, is 
from a mezzanine floor looking down and the other one is my view uh, on the left hand side over to Canary Wharf. Um, one of the projects I'm doing is actually kind of make a piece of work about the beginning and the end of, of the Thames and uh, it's sort of going backwards as it were up the source of the river to try and find uh, where it begins and that's a large project but I've got all the maps up on the wall and it's about 14 meters long. Um, the little one on the bottom left is a cast of, of my mouth so it's become a kind of inverted cast and the image in the middle is a repair because I sometimes get repairs to the, that series of work which is about the lungs because they are quite fragile um, so that's a little job waiting and the other one is one of my desks. Um, so conversely to that, which I was mentioning before about doing residencies, I did one about 20 years ago in the Royal Institution. And when I was a child in London, I, uh, sorry, in Edinburgh, I kind of watched the Christmas lectures and loved them. So it was such a privilege to get a Leverhulme residency there. And I kind of got access to everything. I was given a key, it was on Albemarle Street, just behind the Royal Academy. It just felt really exciting. And my studio was on the roof in a kind of room that had originally been a ping pong room for the, for the artist, uh, sorry, the scientists. So I kind of watched a lot of different things, including this is Bryce and Gore demonstrating different things about scientific phenomena and met various people and got very interested in looking at scientific, the way that they model, the way that they make models, the way that they gather information. And one of the things I liked a lot was this Campbell Stokes sunshine recorder. Um, and this is the kind of these, these um, little kind of bits of paper, the things that you get from the back. If, the, if you look on the bottom left hand side, the sun comes through the globe and then burns a line in, into these pieces of paper at the back, which they change every day. And when I was in Australia, I managed to get, they, they used them over there, I managed to get um, Alice Springs data and I'm kind of comparing it to Northern Southern Hemisphere. So that's an ongoing project really. <clears throat> and that's it in Berwick where I did a residency some time ago. So I etched it through, I laser cut it through sheets of, me of metal and that's it. So it's a perforation and it's almost a little bit like a kind of Morse code or a kind of fingerprint of that data on that particular day. And that's it close up. So it's sunshine, not sunlight. So this was one when there was sunlight, but there wasn't much sunshine. So it was a tiny little perforation in the, on one of the sheets. And another piece that I've made, which um, came from a conversation I had um, with a meteorologist who had an apparatus that he stuck out of a plane that he made. And these are in indents from cloud formations that he, he got and he gave me some which I've actually got upstairs and I cherish them because they gave me, he made them the, the year I was born and they're very, very fragile. So as a result of that, I made a piece which ended up being shown in the VNA, which was about cloud formation. So even just these small conversations that you have or I have with people can have such a significant effect depending on the way the conversation goes. And that's it. I think that was shown at the RSA as well. It's a huge plinth that was being had to be brought down the stairs. Um, and I think it was a, a trial for those who had to do it. Um, it's called conditions and they're subsurfaced etched into glass. I won't go into too much detail, but it's a kind of process which is a little bit like the laser eye um, um, procedures that people can have and uh, so it's got a focal range and it and that, so it doesn't go any further and it just disrupts the glass from the inside with the, using the laser. And that's actually a nod to my Scottish origin because that's January. I didn't say that they went from January. To, there were one, one uh, uh, each, each uh, glass um, piece was um, related to the month of the year. And this one is actually January and it, it's a kind of low level har basically. Um, I take photographs as mentioned. This is me on a voyage, the Scottish expedition run by Cape Farewell. I think we were on Rona and I was kind of off the edge of a cliff trying to take these photographs. Um, it was pretty wild, but I loved it. And that helped inform making a piece um, 
which was about um, wave formation. And this was shown at the Pier Arts Centre. And it's made of uh, vacuum formed plastic and each piece is different. And it's kind of about that idea that the surface of water picks up um, what's above it and what's below it in terms of its sort of what, how it reacts. And that's the glass lungs. That's a larger version. So I just showed you the smaller one in the, in the sitting room and a piece that I made at the British School at Rome called Making Sense, which was kind of using glass, which I often use to make a structure that's very fragile and physical at the same time. And for projects, I've had my own kind of brain scanned and uh, made a piece called Sense, which was to do with the activated areas in the brain when you experience the five senses. And uh, this, is, this is the kind of three-dimensional um, work, um, sort of models. And that's the piece Sense, which again has actually been shown in the RSA um, some time ago now in their annual show, I think it was. And that's seeing, which is the back of the visual cortex, which is kind of, um, so yeah. So when you get whiplash, it can affect your sight. So it's just right at the back of your, or your, your skull. And you've seen that piece. And this is a piece that I made, which now belongs to the RSA actually. It's my portfolio piece and it's called Fault. And it was made, um, it's quite large. It was made uh, by casting either side of Loch Ness. And the, where Loch Ness meets, there's the Great Glen Fault. And I cast either side with a team, including Ginny Morris, who's a very good caster. And uh, then we pulled it off the different geological, distinct geological um, parts either side. And, um, and that's what they looked like close up. So these huge big silicon molds, which were stored in um, the, art, the um, museum in Inverness until I could get somebody to pick them up. And this is us then using those pink molds, which made fault, which belongs to the RSA now. And now this is it making the kind of final piece, which was a public artwork called, called um, Seer. And that related to the idea of the brand Seer which many of you may know, but he foresaw catastrophes and one of them, and, and I was thinking about the idea of not, not that it would be about looking um, as, it wouldn't be sort of to emulate what he was um, seeing, but the idea of perhaps turning it around and making it into something more positive. Um, so this is us installing a couple of years ago, one wintry November day, and that's it. And basically either side of the tectonic plates look up into the city of and the castle. And I kind of like that idea. And this is me touching either side earlier in the morning when it was still misty. The sun came out later on. But the idea that you could touch both tectonic plates and make one between and be a human kind of bridge. Um, this is something that I can... Um, send round if anybody's interested. And I was looking it up on my Instagram because at the opening of the art and poetry exhibition at the RSA, Rab Wilson, who wrote this in response to my work and my ideas, um, recited it. And it's on my Instagram if anybody uses it on the 5th of the 5th, 2018. And um, it's um, him in reciting it in, in Scottish. And he did an English translation. And it was lovely, the idea that this, my work could, you know, um, or our conversation could generate a piece of poetry. Um, it was Callum Colvin who put us together, which was fantastic. Um, other work I've made, which are public artworks, which I won't go into too much detail, but these are, uh, this one's in engineering department at the University of Bristol. The idea of kind of taking the land mass out and up and then actually inverting it and because it was the engineering department, I was sort of thinking that in a way engineers can kind of almost feels like they can do anything, at least in Bristol, when I went round to the different departments. And so it was kind of inspired that idea. And um, this is the piece that I mentioned in Oxford Biochemistry Department. Um, suspended. I took two birds, scanned them. That's what the dots are. And then put them together and then cast them. And this is a piece that still remains there. 
and it's kind of about the idea of what happens when things collide together and anim the animals sort of um, fight or look like they're being intimate basically. Uh, the colour relates to um, heat. A piece I made for Oxford Brooks um, was between a lecture theatre and a library and they wanted me to again make a suspended piece so I kind of thought as I've worked in academia for a very long time that there's such a lovely moment when the penny drops and uh, when somebody sort of has a revelation and they kind of understand something so I wanted to use that idea of a droplet of water and it kind of cascading to sort of start to begin to think about that idea of the rippling effect and the resonance of that and so this is the piece um, it's suspended from the ceiling and it kind of occupies the space and it's called resounding so it's almost acoustic as well as it refers to the acoustics as well as um, you know kind of a droplet of water and these are the kind of things I have to do so many things in advance because I don't have a studio that's that high to test it out so we're often sort of putting it up and this is all I work with uh, Steve Haynes, who helps me do some of the casting. And he originally, you can see his sculpture of Iggy Pop on the left. Um, he makes a lot of work for Mark Wallinger and other people. And um, he's fantastic. So this is us leaving the studio, his studio, um, putting the top piece. You can sort of see the scale of it now. Uh, it's not so clear in the other photographs. And this was us installing, it took us about five days. And then finally, I thought I'd put this piece in because I did a piece uh, with Richard Murphy Architects. He, he's obviously very involved with the RSC in architecture area. And um, I was picked to do this, Anglia Ruskin, and um, the idea that they wanted, I mean, there's something about responding to a brief which I kind of find quite exciting rather than restrictive and one of the things they wanted me to do was to sort of think about what it's like to see science in action which is something I, I like watching anyway so I made this piece which is kind of it's called transformation and it's made up of lots and lots of, of small squares which I think are about five centimeters square um, and that's on the side of the building and it's it moves in the wind a bit like those discs I was showing you upstairs except this is a little bit more um, worked on obviously and um, so that idea that something very small like going to Shaftesbury Avenue and seeing these things glittering you know at night sort of talk, you know which are um, a kind of advertising thing can make me think how I might begin to try to use not the idea but just the sensibility perhaps and there's a little video about this online in Vimeo I can send as a link if you're interested which shows it moving but each it moves all the time and uh, even with the slightest bit of wind and these are my sunflowers as I was talking about and I'm not quite sure what will happen with this but I think there's something it feels very important to have grown them to have harvested them to have cast them and to possibly eat them <laughs> i don't know and i've started to distribute them to different people uh, who've who've said that they want them when i advertised it on instagram so if there's anybody else who wants some giant sunflower seeds they're very welcome i've got plenty so i think I've, that that's kind of where i thought i'd stop and maybe if people wanted to ask questions sorry a bit of a race through but i just thought it might be interesting to see the beginnings and then how things kind of end up often quite a large scale some of the time. Annie, that was absolutely fascinating, fabulous uh, to see your work and how you work through forms. I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, just humbled by the fact that you, you take the science, you take physics, chemistry, geology, uh, the phenomenology of experience, and you find poetry in that. You're kind of, you're kind of, almost trying to bring people to the experience without illustrating it. That, would that be a, 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 a... Well, that's very nice of you to say, because that's exactly what I am, because so many other people do the illustrating far better than me. And I have a huge kind of respect for, for example, um, anatomy illustrators or botanical illustrators or, or people like science communicators like the Bryce and Gore, who I mentioned, who was showing 
who's fantastic and does quite a lot of uh, science communication on Sky and other things. And I mean, people do all these things. I mean, that's, I suppose, you know, so I'm kind of, it's important for me that I'm doing what I feel is right. And, and luckily some of these <clears throat> developments in universities um, where they have new buildings, it's, it's been very useful for me. I mean, I think I'm now on another one. I've just started, actually, I didn't mention, but at UCL um, Department of uh, Neurology is making a huge big centre there, bringing people from all around the world to try to propel the research forward um, as much as possible. So I'm working with them um, on a, a public, public artwork for that, that which will open in 2024. Okay, so um, let's open this up. Uh, are there any uh, of our um, uh, audience that will, I've got a particular question, whether it's about Annie's background, her process, the, the impact of her work, uh, uh, how, how she gets these commissions to show uh, <laughs> uh, these, these huge, these huge uh, wonderful uh, uh, happenings that she makes. Um, I'll put it on to gallery view and I'll see if I can cook some. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you need to take your mute off if you want to ask a question or use the chat. Um, so, uh, Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, just wonder if um, Annie ever wanted to be a doctor. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. one, one parent was, uh, you know, working in hospitals, the other parent was uh, an artist, so you could have gone either way. <laughs> Well, I actually, and, and they and they met when mum was doing kind of arts therapy or um, in, in a TB ward. So she was sort of doing it. I think, you know, when I, um, I, I did, I, I, I actually kind of wanted to do something medical, but somehow never, never got there. And uh, I think I wasn't the best student at school, I have to say. <laughs> I have to admit that. Um, I wasn't, I was too interested in getting out and getting up hills and, and doing other things. So I probably would never have had the qualifications, but oddly working in academia all this time. And, um, you know, I kind of feel like I've, I had my life again, which I, I don't have any regrets, but um, I think um, one of George Garson, who was one of my tutors at Glasgow School of Art, because he asked me that question when I was about 20. And, he, and, I, and I said, yes, I would. And he said, well, go and do it. Just go and do it. And I thought, yes, I suppose I should have done, actually, but I didn't in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have we any other, any other um, burning questions or uh, points of discussion? Yes. Andrea. Andrea? Hi, hi yeah. Um, Annie, um, that was an amazing uh, presentation. Great to see all the models of the work and, the, and the, especially the details of those sunflower casts. Absolutely stunning. Um, but I was just wondering, you know the Public Art Commission that you did, was it in Oxford, the big facade with all the shimmering Yeah. Um, what exactly is the sort of scale of that and how did you install it? Was it like a series of panels that all fitted together or...? Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was actually and um there's a st there's a story behind all that where richard murphy was the architect and then the client um basically got richard murphy's design and then uh got somebody more local to build it i'll leave it at that okay. so uh, anyway we had drawings and i worked with um a company to help me do it all and we made it in panels and we were working to particular measurements um, I think it's 18 meters high um, by about 16 if I remember rightly so each side is there's, there's thousands of these kind of squares and I had to do endless kind of drawings to get the kind of configurations right because it went obviously from silver uh, sort of blue right through to orange and I wanted it to look like it was a kind of natural transition almost of heat but then we got there and 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 um, it turned out that they'd given us the wrong measurements luckily luckily 
it was uh, small um that we'd made more than there was necessary so i have a garage full of the i've got six panels which i'm trying to work out what to do with um which i'm thinking of putting it up in because i live in a close which is kind of a private little close which is very nice i, th I know you've been <laughs> and uh I, i'm sort of thinking i might put one up actually just to kind of to start to, to use them because they need to be activated you know um, but it does need to be high and there isn't really anything high here to do that and I'd probably have to get planning to do it um, anyway yeah so so lots and lots of kind of planning and drawing and I've got a really good guy I work with Rodrigo for the last 10 years who's um, a kind of digital specialist uh, Rodrigo Solanzano and he's moved back to Mexico so we have late night meetings on Skype um, or whatever format we're working on. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of piecing together things. Sometimes I feel like I'm <clears throat> the director of something and other times I feel like when I'm casting the poppy heads or the seeds that I'm much more direct and I quite like that. And I'm, actually the lockdown has made me feel like I, although I'm obviously embarking on this new public artwork for UCL H, which will be great for me. Um, but I'm also looking, I'm, I'm really enjoying the more intimate side of making work actually, and just doing things speculatively mm -hmm. without thinking this is going to be for a particular show. Although having said that, I am going to go back up to Lewis. <laughs> I am going to have a show, hopefully um, a year on from when I was planning to do, we were just talking with the um, Roddy there who's the director and John who's organizing the residencies and we just agreed this will be opening on on the um, Good Friday next year all going according to or, or hopefully if it all goes according to plan so maybe that maybe the um, you know the sunflowers will end up in Lewis thank you Joyce, did you have a question? Yeah, so that was actually the question I was going to ask. Are you intending to go back to Lewis? <laughs> Hold me uh, back. <laughs> uh, no, Annie, it's been fantastic to see these installations. You know, we see work in the RSA, but, you know, it's of a certain scale. And, you know, none of us really have any idea what some of us do. And I think it's been a real revelation. I mean, amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I, I don't, um, it's one of my, things I've been meaning to do for a very long time is get a proper website so that people can just look and find projects and so that's been one of my things I'm trying to organize right now but there's so many different projects and formats and I've been making work feels like for quite a while that um, it's quite difficult to know what to put in and not what not what to put in um, <laughs> but anyway anyway it's 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 as much as kind of inventory of everything and an archive as, as it is a kind of a, a website so if I can just say to somebody oh do you want to look at Anglia Ruskin of Richard Murphy's building I can just direct them to it um, you know but yeah no it's 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 lovely I I really find it exciting I think always feel about Edinburgh the kind of been brought up in Edinburgh and the festival time always felt like people came in to Edinburgh as well as the Edinburgh people kind of rising to the occasion to, and, and they just seem to me to have <clears throat> old friends who, um, who, who would be very involved with the festival and, and occasionally I'd get some free tickets to go along and then suddenly you'd see this massive big kind of installation that had just gone in overnight. Um, you know, and I just, I think I find that very inspiring that you could think quite big if you had the budget. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all very well thinking big, but you know, and I think part of that thing that Robbie's mentioning about getting these commissions is, you know, is perhaps to, it, it, once you've had one or two, it's easier to persuade people to take a risk than if you start off. The first one was the Oxford Biochemistry, and uh, that was a very fortunate, lucky moment to be invited to make something for the atrium and working with that team was fantastic. Um, so, you know, kickstarted me on the kind of public art um, route, which I've sort of always had a project going at some stage. Yeah. Thanks for joining us all. Uh, we're delighted to hear your thoughts on the series so far and what else you'd like to see. Um, edited highlights of all our sessions will be made available at the end of the six. 
Up next on Thursday, the 3rd of September, is The Architect, and it follows on nicely from uh, what Annie's been talking about, Mary Arnold Foster. Um, and then uh, the final planned, although I'm sure we'll do more beyond that, is uh, the painter and artist Keith McIntyre on the 17th of September. And uh, keep an eye out for those. So but thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you all at the next one, hopefully.